All right, welcome back, everybody. You are probably either in the midst of your techne speeches or about to be in the midst of your techne speeches. So in either case, good luck, congratulations, whatever the appropriate thing is for all of you. I tried to warn you a few weeks ago that the second half of this class moves very quickly. And right after speech one, we moved into technical communication and I started talking to you about speech three. As speech two is coming to an end, we're going to focus a lot of our attention on your third major project for this class. I like to think of it as the capstone for this class, and that capstone is a small group deliberation. Up until this point, the public speaking history and theory that I've taught you has mostly been about one person giving a speech by themselves to a small room or maybe to a little bit of a larger room. But when we're talking about deliberation, there are lots of moving parts. So I want to turn back our attention for a minute to the communication model. Usually when we talk about the communication model, we have one communicative interaction. There is one source. There is one receiver. Or at least that's how we've talked about it up until this point. For your small group deliberations for this class, you are not giving your speech as an individual. It's not Jamie or Sarah or Michael giving a speech. You're going to be doing your deliberation in small groups. So today we're going to spend our time talking about deliberation and how deliberation works. Next week, we're going to spend our energy talking about small group communication. My main reason for teaching you all that is so that you don't kill each other when you give your speeches or prepare your speeches in small groups. In observance of the Veterans Day holiday, we will not meet face to face in here next week. And some of you are already thinking, yes, I get a week off. I would encourage you very much not to skip that small group communication video next week because that's what's going to help keep you all sane for the next month as you work on your deliberation projects. So the class is moving very quickly. We're heading into this last unit. I've tried to build in a lot of time in lab and elsewhere for you all to work on this project because it's not easy, as you might imagine, coming up with a topic for your speech, figuring out how to do research for your speech, getting uh, everyone to agree on what your speech should be about when you are working in teams with other people. So we're going to spend today talking about the deliberation part of that assignment. Next week, we'll spend our time talking about the small group part of that assignment. But if you think back to the communication model, part of why I'm doing this is because a lot of public speaking is not just one person giving a speech and they give the only option and the only position on their topic. But instead, it's one person over here giving a speech to this audience and another person over there trying to reach a different audience and another person over there trying to reach both of those audiences. So we're going to mess with our communication model and look at it when we have multiple sources, multiple receivers. And when we do that, we're going to put together pretty much every lesson that we've had for the last month is going to have some aspect that's related to deliberation. So we're going to spend some time reviewing some of the stuff that you're all doing right now in your techne speeches and talking about technical expertise. For after we talked about technical expertise, we spent two weeks talking about persuasion. Your first two speeches for this class were more on the informative side of that spectrum. Your third one's going to be very much on the persuasive side. And as a result, it's usually a lot harder for people to do a persuasive speech. So we're going to talk a little bit about argumentation, how that works in that setting. Last week, we spent our time talking about civic and community engagement. And that is what deliberation is often all about. It's about using public speaking in order to figure out what the best available option is when we have a controversial issue, we have an unresolved problem. We use deliberation. We use argumentation. We use our speaking skills. We use our listening skills in order to figure out how we make the best decision when we are faced with conditions of uncertainty. So I'm going to start by going back today to about two or three weeks ago when we were talking about persuasion. And one way that I like to frame and talk about persuasion, especially as it relates to claim, evidence, and reasoning, as we talked about, as that triangle of how we know what we think we know when we're dealing with persuasion. A framework that I really like to use is the difference between having an argument and making an argument. Now, I want you to take a second, and I don't know that there's a right or wrong answer to this, but I want you to talk to a neighbor and see if you can figure out what the differences might be between having an argument versus making an argument. So go ahead and talk to someone around you. See if you can come to a consensus on what the differences are.
All right, somebody come back and tell us what they see as the difference between having an argument and making an argument. Because we're talking about this idea of argumentation. At the root of that is argument, but there's different ways of thinking about that concept. So what is the difference between having an argument and making an argument? Anybody want to try? Again, I don't know that there's a right or wrong here, but what are some things that you could see as possible differences between those? I heard some good stuff that you all were saying. Go ahead. OK, that's definitely one difference. When we're having an argument, we got the left side of the screen here. We have at least two people. There's at least two sides. You're trying to persuade each other. There might be more than two people. But if you're writing an essay and it's an argumentative essay, you can do that by yourself. You're still trying to reach that audience. They're just not in the room with you. OK, so that's one big difference. What else? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fair. So having an argument is usually more informal. Oftentimes when we're having an argument, it's with a friend, it's with a partner, it's with a parent or a child. When we're making an argument, it's usually in a more formal setting. It's a speech, it's an essay, it's a debate, it's an, uh, something that we have to use evidence and reasoning for. Okay. Anybody else want to try and get at this difference a little bit more? I thought I saw another hand. Let's try one more. What do you think the standards for argument are when you're having an argument versus making an argument? Which one are they, the standards for arguing higher? I would say that's probably fair. Yeah, making an argument is usually a little bit more organized. You usually have to think about it. You might have to gather evidence and reasoning for it. Having an argument is a little bit more spontaneous. You're in the moment. You realize you had a disagreement, and now you're just trying to win. I think one of the big differences between having an argument and making an argument also has to do with emotions. It can be the case that when you're making an argument, you can get passionate. You can get emotional about it. But oftentimes when we're having an argument, it's usually about emotional management of the two people who are fighting. And it's usually about winning and losing at all costs. It's not necessarily about having the best evidence and reasoning, but it's about trying to say, I'm right and you're wrong. And both kinds of argument are important. And I want you to keep both of these in mind as we think about deliberation, especially as we think about public deliberation. Because when we think about public deliberation, what it often looks like is actually having an argument. It's a whole bunch of people shouting at each other. It's a whole bunch of people name calling. It's a whole bunch of people being bitter and emotional. It's a whole uh, bunch of people being sore losers. If we're making an argument, usually it's that claim, evidence, and reasoning triangle. And usually it's a little bit more logical. It's a little bit less emotional, though I can hear my dissertation advisor saying to me that emotions have their own logic. And logic sometimes has its own emotions, despite Aristotle trying to separate out ethos, pathos, and logos. So what I want you to be thinking about is how both kinds of argument might inform how it is that we deliberate, especially when we deliberate in public. Now part of what we're dealing with when we're dealing with argumentation is uncertainty. One of the main differences between informative and persuasive speaking is that persuasive speaking deals with things that can be otherwise. We always have a degree of uncertainty. There's usually at least two sides and usually three or four or 25 different sides to what the right answer might be. When we're dealing with argumentation, we're in the realm of the probable. We're not dealing with absolute certainty. A few weeks ago when we talked about syllogisms and enthymemes, I said that syllogisms are really good for when we have certainty. And we can say all x's are y's, w is an x, therefore w is also a y. Syllogisms don't work so well for conditions of uncertainty, and that's usually what we have in a world with 7 billion people, in a world with a lot of uncertainty, in a world that's not always all that predictable. We're often trying to give our best judgment. We're trying to resolve cognitive dissonance. We're trying to say, what is the best available option, even though I don't know that there's a right answer? Now, a lot of you have been in high school or middle school or college, even some of your college has taught you that all of education has boxes, and education is just about filling in the right boxes on a Scantron. 
my hope for you is that at least some of your education is more than that. It's about critical thinking. It's about how you make decisions under pressure. It's about how you know what you think you know and why you think you know it. Now, when, just because we don't have certainty in a lot of situations doesn't mean that we're just guessing or that all opinions are equally valid or that we can't have any principles or any core beliefs or anything that we know to be true. Oftentimes, we use the things that we do know in order to try and understand and make decisions about the things that we don't know. And that's usually where argumentation comes in. Argumentation is usually geared toward trying to make reasoned and reasonable conclusions. A reasoned conclusion is one that has some logic to it. We can say why we know X is probably the right answer and not Y. It's reasoned because we can use reasoning to try and make sense of the world. A reasonable conclusion we might think of not so much as having logic and reasoning and evidence, but instead a reasonable conclusion we might think of as something in the stasis of value. It's dealing with whether something is good or bad, whether something is fair or unfair, whether something is just or unjust or ethical or unethical. When we're dealing with reasonable conclusions, we're trying to say this resonates with my life experience. This seems like the right thing to do. And that's ultimately what a lot of argumentation is and I would say probably should be geared toward trying to do. We don't want to just make decisions arbitrarily. We don't want to make decisions that hurt other people. We want to make decisions that are rational. So we try to figure out how do we resolve that uncertainty even if we can never totally resolve it. In the article that you should have read for today, Tom Goodnight, who is a rhetorician who happens to still be alive, I might see him at the conference I'm going to later this week, talks about how argumentation is often bound up in the creative resolution and the resolute creation of uncertainty. And I recognize that's one of those uh, anti-metabole kind of constructions that can be a little bit confusing. When he's talking about the creative resolution of uncertainty, he's talking about cognitive dissonance. We use argumentation because we have option X and we have option Y and we kind of like both of them and we wish we could have the best of both worlds but we can't get the best of both worlds. So we use argumentation to try and resolve that uncertainty and say I'm choosing Y today. Maybe I'll regret that I didn't choose X but I have to make that decision. But sometimes we also use argumentation to actually create uncertainty. Somebody thinks that they have the world figured out and our logic tells us otherwise. So up until Middle Ages, a lot of people thought that the sun revolved around the Earth. And that was taken for granted at the stasis of factor conjecture as something that we knew to be true until somebody came along and said, no, 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 it's actually the other way around. My evidence is telling me that the Earth revolves around the sun and spent a lot of time trying to argue that it is actually the case that the Earth revolves around the sun. So sometimes we actually use argumentation to create uncertainty because people think they have certainty and they don't actually have it. Now when we're talking about argumentation, we're talking about deliberation, there's a concept that's really important for you and it's a concept that ties back to what we talked about last week with civic or community engagement. And that concept is the burden of proof. When we have arguments, when we make arguments, there's a concept called the burden of proof that says, when we have disagreements, whose job is it to prove that they're right? Whose job is it to prove that the other side is wrong? And last week we talked about my Foundations of Civic and Community Engagement course and I gave you the term foundation, tied it to stability. I gave you the term engagement and I tied it to change. It is always the case in argumentation when we're talking about deliberation, when we're talking about public policy, that the burden of proof historically rests with the person who's advocating change, the person on the engagement side of the equation. And the reason for that is because we presume that unless we're told otherwise, what we accept as true now is the truth. So if you want to convince us otherwise, the burden of proof falls on you to prove why the status quo isn't working, why it is that the earth revolves around the sun and not the other way around why we should pass this law instead of the law that we currently have. That burden of proof always, founds, uh, always falls upon the person who's, or group who's trying to make change. So that's an important concept to keep in mind. Another thing to keep in mind is the difference between deliberation and debate. 
I'm not asking you to do a small group debate, though I have taught argumentation classes, I've taught debate classes where that is the final project, and you get up in two by two teams and debate each other, and usually the team that wins the debate gets the better grade, and usually the team that loses the debate gets the worst grade. I'm not having you do that in part because I don't like that structure of winners and losers. I don't like at the end of the semester, this group gets an A, this group gets a C, and that's why their grades are different. What I'm asking you to do instead is not to debate one another, but to collectively deliberate. And the differences between those two mostly rest with whether there is a winner or loser at the end of it. It can be the case that if you have a deliberation, there is a right answer. It can also be the case with a deliberation that you have multiple possible options. You don't really like any of them, but you have to advocate for the one that is the best available option. In fact, that's exactly what I'm going to ask you to do. So rather than having a pro side and a con side and you all debate each other and one side wins or loses, as a team, what you all are going to do is say, we have this controversial issue, we have this problem, let's look into three or four possible different solutions to that problem and how different groups have advocated for those three or four solutions. And let's pick what we think is the best available option. Oftentimes, deliberation is a precursor to debate. Deliberation is about information gathering. It's about informed decision making. It's not about winning and losing so much as it is about making good pragmatic decisions that most of us, if not all of us, would be comfortable living with. So that's what I'm going to have you do for that final project. There's another thing to keep in mind, and this is coming out of our same tradition that teaches us a lot of what we've talked about in public speaking this semester. And that is the when of argument. And this comes from Aristotle when he's giving us things like the five canons, when he's giving us things like early forms of stasis theory, when he's giving us ethos, pathos, and logos, he's looking at who's making public speeches in ancient Greece. And he says, we've got three different uh, categories or three different times that are relevant when we're making speeches. We've got forensic speeches or judicial speeches. Those deal with matters of the past. We talked about stasis theory and how stasis theory arose because there are lots of people being on trial. And there was debates over whether they were innocent or guilty. If they were innocent or if they were guilty, how severe was their crime? What is the appropriate punishment for them? That's very past oriented at the stasis of factor conjecture. It's dealing with what happened at the stasis of definition. What kind of crime is it? That's a matter of the past and it's often concerned in ancient Greece with matters of innocence or guilt. From there, we could talk about epideictic speeches. Epideictic speeches are what we're going to talk about in here in a few weeks. Those are ceremonial speeches. Rather than dealing with matters of the past, epideictic speeches deal with things that are happening in the here and now. So last week, after the shooting in Pittsburgh, there were lots of epideictic speeches that were eulogies. They were saying, this thing happened. There's an elephant in the room. We have to talk about this elephant in the room. And when we talk about the elephant in the room, it doesn't always have to be sad like a eulogy. It can be a celebration, it can be an inauguration, it can be a retirement ceremony, it can be a life cycle event like a wedding or a baby being born. We have epideictic speeches and those are often dealing with praise and blame and those are trying to tell us what are the things that we care about. This person or this group is being honored today, here is why they are our, hero, our heroes. The last realm that we have is the deliberative realm and that's dealing with matters of the future. That's dealing with questions of should or shouldn't. What should we do as Athenians? What should we do as Americans? How do we know that this is the best course of action? And when we're dealing with matters of the future, it's often in that realm of uncertainty still. We can't predict the future. We can't know what is best, but we have to do our best to guess. If this looks a little bit familiar to you, it's probably because it resembles stasis theory a lot. I told you when I taught you stasis theory that oftentimes stasis theory in the United States when we're in deliberation is usually at the stasis of policy. And people like to rush to that stasis of policy and try to de determine what we should or shouldn't do even when there are unresolved questions at some of the earlier stases. When we're dealing with deliberative rhetoric, we're trying to figure out what the best course of action is and deliberative is the root of where we get deliberation. So we're trying to deliberate about what we should do in any given scenario. That's going to take us not to the public realm of public deliberation, but I'm going to have you 
deal with a scenario privately that's going to deal with a condition of uncertainty. As you see up on the board here, this is your participation question for the week. You can go ahead and log in. We are in week 12 of the semester. Your participation question this week is going to ask you what you would do in this situation. So you take your car in for an oil change, and your car is about 14 years old. The car's got about 140,000 miles. When performing routine diagnos diagnostics, the service technician tells you that your car needs a new serpentine belt. She tells you that the belt looks worn, and if it goes out, it likely will take the water pump, the power steering, and the alternator with it. She says that the parts and labor are going to come to about $483. So my question for you for this week is, do you replace it now, or do you take your chances? Just go with your gut instinct. You can go ahead and log into Blackboard. We are in week 12. Go ahead and answer this question. If you have any trouble logging into Blackboard, what you need to do is email your lab instructor your answer to that question. So I want you to think about it. I want you to answer that question. Again, we are in week 12 of the semester. It's kind of hard to believe we're already there. And once you have submitted your answer for this week's participation question, what I'd like you to do is talk to your neighbor and tell them whether you would replace the serpentine belt on the spot or whether you would take your chances and drive off and see what happens. I knew you all would. <laughs> You're not allowed to answer the question. That's why you said that earlier. Yep. <laughs> All right, you might not be finished answering that question, but raise your hand if you would replace it now on the spot. About half of you, okay. Raise your hand if you would take your chances and drive away from Valvoline or Jiffy Lube or your local mechanic. Only a handful of you, okay. My last class was pretty evenly split. Somebody who tells me that they would replace the, replace the serpentine belt on the spot, tell me why you chose that answer. Okay, so it's if I pay $483 now, it'll save me the headache of possibly paying thousands of dollars or even needing a new car later. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so if you get stuck somewhere, if your serpentine belt rips or goes out, you're pretty much stuck where you are. And we're stuck where you are could be in the middle of the highway, Stuck where you are could be in a parking lot. Stuck where you are could be in the middle of a city. You're pretty stuck, okay? So you don't want to get stuck. You don't want to have to pay for towing. You don't want additional charges. Somebody else? Why else would we take our chances now? Or sorry, not take our chances now. Why else would we replace the thing now? Nobody's willing to share? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so it's possible that if this part goes out and some of these other parts go along with it, you won't just have to pay a lot of money to get your car fixed, but it could have you swerving, it could have you crashing, you could hurt someone else, you could hurt yourself. Okay. Somebody tell me why you chose to take your chances with the serpentine belt and drive away from the mechanic. Yeah. Okay, so you would buy the belt and put it on yourself so it would be cheaper. How many of you in this classroom would know how to do that? The people who chose it. Okay, <laughs> fair enough. Somebody else, tell me why you would take your chances with this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so sometimes mechanics lie because they want your money. Sometimes mechanics lie because they want to charge you for parts and labor, mostly the labor part. Okay. I'll let you all ask Google, how much is a serpentine belt? First person to get it wins. Go. How much is a serpentine belt? 
$25, okay? I've seen it, when I had this happen to me, it was about $35. Well, that means that they're charging you $35 for that serpentine belt. They might be charging you a little bit of money in terms of shipping that serpentine belt, but it's probably not gonna be more than five or 10 bucks. That means they're charging you about $450 for the labor of replacing your serpentine belt, which does not take five, six hours to do. So they're way overcharging you. When I had this done, it was like 130 bucks. So a lot of you let your nerves get the best of you and you decided, I'm just gonna get this replaced right now because I don't have the knowledge, I don't have the expertise to be able to do it. Now some of you probably also had the experience of saying, I don't like these two options. Brad keeps giving us these limited options. I like a different option. I really wish I had the option to call someone. My dad or my friend is a mechanic, or at least they know more about cars than me. Could I call someone before I have to make this decision? Or some of you are thinking, well, I'll just take out my phone and I'll Google it. And those are, in some scenarios, valid options. But a lot of you probably had the experience of being frustrated that you don't have the technical knowledge to know whether this is a good idea. You don't have the technical expertise to be able to do this yourself, although some of you clearly do. And the reason I say this is because it's gonna get us at the theory that we're gonna be talking about today, which is helping us make decisions under conditions of uncertainty, especially when we're in different contexts. The theory that we're gonna be talking about today is called sphere theory. The article that you should have read was about spheres of argument, and I've put those spheres up on the board here. I recognize that when Tom Goodnight wrote this article, he wasn't writing for a bunch of undergraduates like you, although he might have had you in mind. He was really more writing for professors and other rhetoricians like me. So I have a little bit more of the technical knowledge to be able to decipher this. I'm hoping that you at least got some sense of what it's about. I also recognize that it's challenging, so I'm gonna walk you through it a little bit. What Tom Goodnight was talking about when he wrote this original piece in the 1980s was figuring out when we have to make decisions, how do we know who to trust and where do we make decisions and who gets to help us in our decision-making process. So he's got three different spheres up on the board. I have them represented two-dimensionally here, but you might think of them instead more like bubbles. You might think of them as interconnected bubbles, and you'll see here that they're still in Venn diagram format. There are times when the personal and the technical sphere overlap. There are times when all three of them overlap. And that's what I want you to be aware of because this is what you're going to be doing with your final project. You're probably gonna to have to think about these different kinds of spheres of argument. If you're really thinking critically, you might have realized that I set up this course to be in line with these three public spheres. I'd like to say that I did that intentionally, but I was actually talking to Tom Goodnight around this time last year when I designed the course and I said, Public sphere theory is so ingrained in my mind that I set up the three major speeches for this class to be a personal speech, a technical spe a speech, and a public speech. I didn't plan that, but I'm really glad that it worked out that way. So we have three different speeches. Your first speech was on something personal, something that was meaningful to you. Your second one was on something related to your professional life or your career or your major. Your third one is going to be in this public realm where we're gonna be talking about public policy issues. We're gonna have a somebody should do something to fix some kind of social or political problem. So let me break these down for you and you'll see why treating these separately but also treating them together matters for how we make arguments and how we do civic and community engagement. Before I get into each realm individually, I think it's important to start from the place of where we often start in civic and community issues and that's talking about the differences between public spaces and private spaces. Now, oftentimes we think that there are certain things that we only deal with in private. We like to say that we like to have privacy when we're talking about or doing those things. Or we like to say that when we're being Minnesota or North Dakota nice, that we're not supposed to talk about some of these things because they are private, and as a result, they're a little sensitive. So you're not supposed to talk about sex. You're not supposed to talk about drug use. You're not supposed to talk about mental illness. You're not supposed to talk about race. You're not supposed to talk about laundry list of things that we often think of are closely related to the private sphere. When we're talking about the public sphere then, we have all kinds of issues that we all can get behind or we all have at least some stake in. We might not agree on what we want as the outcome. We can say there are issues that affect us publicly like immigration policy like how the University of North Dakota operates its budget or how the state of North Dakota operates its budget. Those are things that we generally think of as public. And people often like to separate out those spheres and say that if you're de deliberating in the private sphere, 
it's a little bit different than if you're deliberating about some of those big political or social issues that we're talking about. Now there's a feminist mantra that says the personal is political. And what that mantra is saying is that middle space there is saying that anything that I think of as private has some kind of public connotation to it. So a few weeks ago, I led a discussion on UND's campus about sexual violence. And I had several students, even in a small group, who came and said, I'm a survivor of sexual violence. And someone else said, me too. And someone else said, me too. And we like to think of sexual assault and sexual violence as part of the private sphere. But if there are multiple people experiencing it, then it's a public problem. One of my favorite books that I've ever read was by Dana Cloud, who we read a little bit of last week. Her first book talks about mental health, and she says there are a lot of people who struggle privately with mental health. And our solution to mental health in the United States is often one of two things. It's either psych uh, psychiatric drugs or it's therapy. Both of those things are individual treatments for the underlying issue that we treat as private. And yet, there are a lot of people who struggle with mental health issues. In the last few years, I've noticed an uptick in the number of students who have come to me and said, I have anxiety. I have depression. I have both. I'm not going to make you self-identify in here, but I imagine that that's not something that's unique to just one or two people in this room. Dana Cloud's argument in her first book, Control and Constellation in American Politics, is saying that if we started treating mental health as a public good rather than a private one, we would have different solutions for how we handle mental health, and those solutions might actually be better and more effective than just giving everyone drugs or just sending everybody to therapy. So those two realms are much more connected than we like to think. And as you're trying to figure out your topics for your deliberations, you might actually start in that private sphere and say, hey, I have this issue that concerns a family member of mine. Maybe that's what I want to talk about for this speech. In any case, there are often loose boundaries between those two realms. Now let me break down all three of these for you. We'll start with the one that's probably the easiest for you, and that is the personal or private sphere. If you read Goodnight's piece this week, you'll recognize that he uses those two terms interchangeably. It can get a little bit confusing. I would pick one or the other and stick with it. So we'll call it the private sphere for now. And when we're talking about the private sphere, what we're talking about are arguments that we often have with our friends, with our family members, with our significant others. It's usually an interpersonal kind of conversation. Sometimes it can be about making an argument, but oftentimes it's just about having an argument. And it's banter back and forth, and we don't put a whole lot of stakes into it. We are interested in winning and losing, but we don't necessarily cut off ties with these people because they disagree with us on what kind of beer is our favorite beer. The evidence in the private sphere is usually loose evidence. It's usually things that I know from my personal experience. Or it's stories. It's some anecdote or narrative that may have happened to me or may have happened to somebody know. Yeah, well, my friend lives in Indiana, and he had that problem, and here's how he solved it. So there. That's the kind of evidence that we're usually talking about. In the 21st century, sometimes it goes a little bit beyond that, and people will pull out their phones and say, no, it was actually Edward Norton in that movie, not somebody else. But even so, the evidence that we're looking for is usually not, that ver not very strong. <laughs> And as a result, the scrutiny of that evidence is also usually pretty low. We don't necessarily hold people to very high standards. We don't expect them to cite sources. We don't expect them to make strong connections among claim evidence and reasoning. And when they have evidence, we don't necessarily know what is good or not so good evidence. The goals that we have in the private sphere when we have or make arguments in the private sphere is often to win. It's often to look cool. It's often to be socially accepted. It's to recalibrate our relationships. And so oftentimes, we're either deciding whether we want to maintain this relationship with a person or whether we want to dissolve a relationship with that person. A lot of times, arguments in the private sphere are also contextualized by arguments that we've had with that person in the past. How reliable has this person been for me when I was in need? When we had this other argument before, I was really mad about it, and I didn't tell them, but I'm still mad about it. That's what we're often talking about in the private sphere. We move from the private sphere then to the opposite end of the continuum, not the public sphere yet, but instead the technical sphere. If we're talking about making an argument, the technical sphere is where we really have a lot of stakes invested. You might remember from our discussion of technical communication that the origin of the word technical, what we might think of as professional communication, comes from the Greek root techne. And a techne is some field that somebody could gain professional experience or knowledge or skills in. 
that the average person doesn't have, something like your major, something like your job. Most people who have a techne will practice that techne for years and years at a time in order to be labeled a doctor, a lawyer, a dentist, whatever they happen to be. So they have to go through special professional training. We also remember that techne is the same root that's at the origin of the word technology. A lot of our technology is very technical in nature. Technology is designed to make our lives easier and to sometimes substitute for those skill sets or knowledge, uh, knowledge sets that we would otherwise need to keep up in our brains. The who that's involved in the technical sphere is usually people that we would think of as experts. And I put experts in quotation marks because one person's expertise might be another person's, yeah, so what? When we have experts, or so-called experts, they usually have to go through a lot of training. They usually have to have a lot of knowledge and skills that the average everyday person has. And you probably know that just because some person is an expert in one thing doesn't mean that they're an expert in everything. If you watch a lot of contestants on Jeopardy, they do really well with history questions, and then they get to the sports category, and it's like, hmm, I don't know anything about sports. Some of you could probably tell me who has won the Super Bowl every year for the last 15 years. There's different levels of expertise. And I put experts in quotation marks because sometimes people are experts, or we think they're experts, and they're not really experts in the thing they're claiming expertise in. So somebody like Dr. Phil, a lot of people look to to provide kind of psychological advice or therapy. He is not trained as a psychologist, and it drives my sister nuts that he calls himself Dr. Phil. But we have lots of people who are experts in one subject area who maybe are borderline experts on things. And those experts sometimes get things wrong as well, and so we have to be cautious of that. But when we're dealing with the technical sphere, we're trying to get the best evidence that we can find. There's a reason why a lot of your professors tell you to cite sources from scholarly journals or to cite books that have recently been published by peer-reviewed academic presses or peer-reviewed academic journals. The reason for that is the people who are writing those things are people like them. There are other people who have gone to graduate school, gotten a doctorate, spent the last 15 or 20 years writing about a subject. When something goes out to a scholarly journal, there's usually a team of three reviewers who will look at it. And that team of three reviewers decides whether this knowledge that we're creating is acceptable or good or the best quality and the most recent kind of knowledge or if it's not good enough. A lot of those peer-reviewed journals have rejection rates of about 90%. And they're rejecting 90% of people who have PhDs. And they're saying, your argument's not good enough. Come back to me when you have better evidence. Come back to me when you have better reasoning. So our standards for evidence in the professional or technical sphere is usually very, very high. And the reason for that is because we want to make sure that if we are the gatekeepers of knowledge and wisdom, that we're giving the best available and the newest knowledge and wisdom that we have. So the goals in the technical sphere are often to make or create or preserve new knowledge. And sometimes new knowledge in a field like history might not be all that, you know, it might not have to be up on what happened two weeks ago. In a field like data analytics, in a field like journalism, you might have to know what happened yesterday. You might have to be an expert in that. So we have this personal sphere where the evidence and the standards are very low. We have the technical sphere where the evidence and standards for evidence are very high. We also have this third sphere, this public sphere. And that is where civic and community engagement happens. When we're talking about the public sphere, we're talking about the first three words, the preamble of the US Constitution, we the people. Our audience is not just some person that we're friends with or someone that we're related to, but it's a universal or general audience. We talked in here with audience analysis, and I gave you friendly, mixed, and hostile audiences. Most audiences for public deliberation are mixed audiences, and they're mixed demographically, they're mixed in terms of values, they're mixed in terms of beliefs. And so you're trying to appeal to the public, whatever the public means. When we're talking about evidence in the public sphere, it's not necessarily just stories or anecdotes or things more on the pathos side of evidence. But it's not studies and lab reports and experiments and interviews and things that are always on the professional side of things either. Often what we have is a mix of those two things. If it gets too technical, it's usually dry and boring and it might not be clear or explainable to the public. There's a whole field of communication science that says scientists are not good at communicating their studies and translating them for the average everyday citizen. What we have as the standard for evidence in the public sphere is 
what wins out in the so-called marketplace of ideas. We have lots of debates over big issues in this country. We often solve those debates, or at least try to solve those debates, by gauging public opinion. Sometimes we measure that through public opinion polling. Some of that polling is a little bit flawed. Sometimes we measure that public opinion based on what people are saying or what they're doing. So the scrutiny for the public sphere varies, but it usually has people and evidence from the other two spheres involved in trying to tell us what the best decision that we can make is. The goal of good public sphere communication or deliberation is to try and figure out what is for the public good. What makes the United States or another country or another group or another place a more perfect union? How is it that we can have differences and we might have people who win and lose a little bit in politics? How can we create policies that are the best kinds of policies that maybe if we can't get everyone to agree on them, we can at least get most people to agree on them and feel pretty good about them most of the time? Essentially, the goal in the public sphere is pragmatic thinking. It's being informed decision makers. It's not rushing to the stasis of policy and saying, I'm my way or the highway but instead is about learning from each other, information gathering, trying to make the best decisions that we can make, and not just for myself and my own self-interest, but for everybody involved, or as many people as I can possibly get. Now, if we go back to the public sphere, or to the three spheres as a whole, bear with me, you'll see that all three of these are interconnected. And so Goodnight is talking about them, and he's saying there's a time when it's important for us to have arguments in the private sphere. There's a time when it's important for us to get experts from the technical or professional sphere. But all of us, if we want to have a quality civic life, if we want to have good politics, if we want to try and make society better, all of us should be involved and invested in that public sphere where we're arguing together and we're trying to come up with good decisions and everyone's voices need to be heard. Even in 1982, though, Tom Goodnight was very concerned that it wasn't playing out that way. What he was observing instead in the 80s, before some of you were even born, was that the personal sphere, the private sphere, and the technical sphere had become so big in our lives that they are eclipsing the public sphere. What he's saying about that is actually that we spend a lot of time, if we're not experts and we're not at work, we spend a lot of time in the private sphere. We spend a lot of time keeping up with the Kardashians. We spend a lot of time at the mall. We spend a lot of time with our family at the zoo. We spend a lot of time arguing at the bar. And we don't really make or have a whole lot of time to be civically or politically engaged. And there are a lot of studies that came out long after this piece was published that talk about the decline of civic and community participation. That if you talk to our parents, if you talk to their grandparents, people were much more involved civically and politically. They had lots of associations that required them to, God forbid, interact with everyday other people. And in even as late as the 80s, or as early as the 80s, we might say, a lot of people had given up that interest in the public sphere in favor of things like movies, in favor of things like television, in favor of things like music in favor of things like drinking and drugs and sex. When we give up that public sphere to have more of a private sphere, what Goodnight is saying is that when, pardon the expression, when shit hits the fan and we've got difficult decisions to make, we don't know how to answer those questions because we don't have the professional expertise. And if we spend all of our time keeping up with the Kardashians, when shit hits the fan, we turn to experts and we say, Please, I don't know how to solve this problem. Tell me what I need to do. Should we go to war? Should we drill for oil here? Should we have this policy or that policy on immigration? They default to experts. And there's some value in that. Experts are experts for a reason. None of you would want me to do a root canal on you. I don't think that would be a pleasant experience. Even though I'm an expert in communication, I am not a dentist. But one of the problems with that is when we default to the experts, experts get things wrong some of the time. Experts tell us, yeah, you might have cancer, you might not have cancer, we have to do some more testing. Experts tell us, yeah, it's totally okay to drill for oil in the Gulf of Mexico and then Deepwater Horizon happens and thousands of gallons of oil wash up on shore. So we have lots of experts in the technical sphere who get things wrong and both private citizens 
and professional experts have let those realms eclipse the public sphere. And Goodnight was concerned with this in the 80s. He republished this article again about six years ago on the 30th anniversary. And I bet if you asked him about it, and I probably will ask him if I run into him this weekend, he's got some other concerns in the age that you all grew up in. He's got some concerns with the internet. He was writing about music and television making us stupid. I think he would say that the internet's making us even dumber. So one of Goodnight's concerns is that if we refer to experts to help us with our problems, most of the time those experts are still our best bet for how to solve problems. But some of you are starting already to not really care a whole lot about expertise. You're kind of flattening expertise. You're saying, I can go instead to what my, one of my sociology friends lovingly calls Dr. Google and say, I don't need to call up an electrician or a plumber. I'll just do it myself. I don't need to call the mechanic to tell me if I'm going to replace my serpentine belt. I'm just going to figure out how to do it myself. And there's some value in that too, that root of technology and techne and technical expertise coming through technological expertise. But Google, just like the human beings who identify as experts, also gets things wrong. Google also has algorithms that filter to you things that you like to see and things that you know a whole lot about. So I don't know that that's necessarily the best option, just saying, let me Google that for you. Probably not always the best option. The other thing that Tom Goodnight would probably be concerned with is this idea that we spend so much time on social media if we spend all of our time in the private sphere on Facebook and Twitter, you've seen what so-called deliberation looks like on Facebook and Twitter. It's not good quality deliberation. It's people trying to win the internet. It's people trolling each other. It's people being pretty awful to each other. They're trying to win and lose. They're trying to have an argument, but they're not really trying to make an argument through Facebook and Twitter. So my challenge for you for the end of the semester, one of my challenges for you is to recover that lost public sphere. How can you all as UND students do better and recover some of that lost art of public deliberation that our parents and grandparents were better at? So one of my challenges for you is a group deliberation assignment. Before you all head out, I just want to remind you of a couple things for what you're going to be doing. Part of that challenge is that that assignment is persuasive in nature. Part of the other challenge of that is what we're going to talk about next week, even though you won't be physically here, and that is we're going to be speaking in small groups. So you're crafting, researching, writing, delivering your speech, not as one individual, but as a team of a larger group. In that deliberation, you've got either a problem solution format or a problem cause solution format. Your thesis for that speech is going to be some governing body, some group that has power to make change happen, should, and then some very specific policy. You as a group are going to have to agree on which problem you want to solve, how you want to solve it, what options you're going to look into for possible solutions to that problem. As part of your speech, you're going to actually have to list off what are proposed solutions that other groups have given. And the reason for that is to get around what a lot of social scientists refer to as confirmation bias. If you were to give a speech on a topic you care about, you probably already have your position on that topic you could probably gather evidence to support your own position pretty easily. The critical thinking that's part of that lost public sphere requires you to not just do speaking, but also to do what we talked about a few weeks ago with listening. So you're going to have to identify three or four possible solutions. You might not love any of them. Nevertheless, your group has to figure out what the best available option is. And it's going to be somehow tied to either civic uh, political engagement or civic social engagement. So you, in being on the engagement side of that coin, will have to have the burden of proof to make the best case that you can that your group has chosen the best available option. That's a preview for what we're going to be spending about the next month working on together. You'll have lots of time to work on it. Next week, I will not have you face to face, but I'll have a video for you on small group communication so that the first part doesn't scare the crap out of you and so that you all don't kill each other. So we'll come back in two weeks and you can ask questions about that then.